What I'm going to talk about is mainly going to be out of body because that's the name of the game here for these next nine days. So I'm going to talk about things relative to that subject. Like I said, I have a few hours to do that in. If you've been to the website where I have my uh, workshops that I do, uh, you'll notice that day one I get up and talk for eight hours. Day two I get up and talk for eight hours. You know that's 16 hours worth of dialogue, and I just barely scratch the surface of what there is to talk about. So now we have two, maybe three hours I'll be talking and try to, you know, I'm not going to go over all the theory and all of the derivations and where these assumptions come from. So uh, if you don't understand an assumption, like where do you get that or why does he assume that? It's probably because you haven't watched the videos on YouTube but I don't have time to do that now, so we're gonna skip that. So if there's any of these things that leave a big question mark in your mind and as a whole, either ask the question later, or you probably can get most of it filled in if you go to YouTube. And you can find the books for free on Google Books. So if you go there, they're all, they're all laid out for free. If you can't stand reading books on a, you know, on a terminal, then um, you know, come to the website. There's also a website that's uh, www.myvco.com and there's a forum there and any questions you have that pop up a week from now or two weeks from now go to the forum and put them out there there's lots of very uh, knowledgeable people on that forum that will probably be able to answer your question quickly so that's kind of the introduction uh, I'm going to assume this is kind of an advanced class because I'm not going through all the derivations of why does this make sense um, Okay, out of body is primarily a way to directly experience the larger consciousness system. Okay, not a direct path to enlightenment. Okay, so doing out of body isn't necessarily going to make you grow up any. Like any experiential reality, you have to do the growing up yourself. The reality is just a place that maybe nudges you to grow up. Okay, it's not essential or necessary part of evolving the quality of your consciousness. How it, however, it is a way, a way, to facilitate growth, but not necessarily the way. Okay, out-of-body experience is a viable path to facilitate positive growth if you approach it properly. Well, how do you approach it properly? No fear, no ego, no belief, no expectations. Now, I've named four things there, the, the uh, you know, fear, ego, belief, and expectations. There's really only two, and most of the time just one. Okay, fear is the key thing. Ego is a subset of fear. That's your reaction, your personal reaction to the world based in fear is ego. Then we have belief, which most of the time is also fear-based, a fear of not knowing, a fear of something important that you don't know, so you fill in with a belief. But sometimes belief is not fear-based. And then a subset of belief is expectation, something you expect to happen, and it's something you expect it to be a certain way. So these are the things. I could also add in there wants, needs, desires, you know, that sort of thing. But basically, uh, if I said just fear, I figured I covered it all, most of you wouldn't get the full flavor of that. So I, I kind of a little redundant there. I'll, you often use fear, ego, belief, expectation, because those are kind of the biggies that relate to, particularly to out-of-body. Okay, now I know that it's easy to say, get rid of your fear, belief, you know, ego, and expectations. It's a very easy thing to say. Everybody should do that. You know, try to get that done before we finish this talk tonight. But it's, a, it's a really difficult thing to do, because when I'm talking about fear and belief, I'm not talking about things that you necessarily intellectually know that you fear or believe. These, these are beliefs that you get just by being in our culture. A lot of them are cultural beliefs. Some of them, uh, you know, you just pick up from family. Some of them uh, are uh, kind of ingrained uh, by what you hear others say, you know, what you think is important. Um, 
So a lot of these are not beliefs. You wouldn't list them on my list of beliefs. They never show up on your list. A lot of people say, well, I really don't have any beliefs. And I really don't have any fears. And typically that's young males tell me that. But the (laughs) fact is they live their life through belief and fear. We all do. That's what drives us most of the time. That That is what motivates us and that is what gives us problems in our out-of-body experiences. So this relates very much to out-of-body. Um, there are ways to go about getting rid of fear and belief, but we can talk about that later. I won't do that right now. You can ask that in a question if you like. To understand out-of-body, you have to understand the context in which it exists. It's not a process or a place that we go. It's a personal, subjective, real experience. Okay. So here's to give you some of that context. I'll just hit some of these points that'll, that'll kind of build some context. First of all, who are we? We're an individuated unit of consciousness playing a total immersion virtual reality game wherein our avatars make choices and appear to have physical bodies and live in physical space. So that's who we are. What are we doing here? Uh, where, again, this individuated unit of consciousness, it's abbreviated IUOC in, the, in, the, in my books, but uh, we're an individuated unit of consciousness with a mission to evolve the quality of our consciousness through interaction with the set and with others within this virtual reality. We're here to experience, interact, make choices. Okay, what's the point? As we evolve, the larger consciousness system evolves. We are consciousness. We are these individuated units of consciousness. We are part of this larger consciousness system. We are it. It is us. But we're not all of it. We're just a piece of it, you see. So this larger conscious system is just what I call everything. You know, that's the foundation of reality. That's the foundation of what is. It's this larger consciousness system. Uh, If you ever read Seth Speaks, it's what Seth calls all that is. You know, it's the fundamental thing. If you're religious, maybe that's God, but it's the okay, it's the whole of what is. That's the larger consciousness system. Um, okay, we're here to evolve, and as we evolve, evolve means, I can say it in several ways, it means spiritual growth, it means growing up, it means getting rid of fear, you know, ego, belief, an expectation. Okay. It uh, means lowering the entropy of your consciousness. You know, for all of you techies out there, that might mean something. Uh, get into that more in the in the videos. Um, so that's what I mean by growing up, evolving. We are a unit of consciousness, and our job is to evolve the quality of that consciousness. And if we just say that's the getting rid of fear and belief, ego then that's a good definition of what it means to grow up and evolve the quality of your consciousness. Now, when you get rid of this fear and belief, what are you left with? What are you without that? Your love. That's what's left over when you get rid of the fear and the belief. Okay? That's what we really are. That's how we interact. The fear and the belief are it's like an overlay that creates all this difficulty for us. Okay, so I'm kind of giving you a real thumbnail sketch of the kind of the high-level ideas here. Um, as we grow up and we evolve ourselves, the system, which is us too, we're parts of that system, it grows up. So we decrease our entropy just a little bit, then the entropy whole system, because we're part of the system, decreases its entropy just a little bit. So we are part of the larger consciousness systems strategy for evolution. The larger consciousness system is an evolving system. It's not a fixed system. It's not a perfect system. It's an information system. We live in a virtual reality. Reality is composed of nothing other than information. Science is coming to that viewpoint more and more. Every year we hear more and more people who realize that information is at the core of our existence. It's the core of What science studies is the core of what we experience. It's information. Information comes to us, we interpret it. 
data comes to us and we interpret it and we interpret it as this. This is our reality. It's an interpreted reality. All reality is subjective. When you talk about objective reality, it's just less subjective than other more subjective reality, but it's all subjective. Okay, the five people on the street corner all see the same accident, all give different reports. Why? Because reality is subjective. Well, that's just the way it is. It can't be any other way. Now, where the differences come in subjective reality is where there is uncertainty and how we interpret it. Okay, our interpretations are all personal. And some events are more uncertain than others. The more uncertainty, the more we get to interpret, to fill in the uncertainties, you see. So when we're talking about the physical world, then there's less uncertainty, and our interpretation kind of changes around small values. We get into a less certain world, like the world of, you know, economics, psychology, uh, medicine, that sort of thing. There's lots of uncertainty there. So interpretations get bigger and broader, and things are harder to define, harder to resolve. All right, um, so how do we accomplish this goal of growing up as consciousness, evolving our quality and helping the larger consciousness system evolve its quality? And maybe I should have said that the larger consciousness system, why is it bothering? Well, it's just an information system and it's evolving. It's a conscious, aware information system, but it's evolving too. And what are its choices? Evolve or de-evolve. De-evolve means information breaks down, content goes away, you end up with randomness. In information theory, your opposite of, of content is randomness. There's no randomness. If you're, all your bits are random, there's no message. Right? There's, there's no content. So that's if you're an information system, you evolve to increase the quality of your content, the significance and meaningful. So the whole system's evolving. It's not a fixed stand, you know, thing that's, that's, uh, that's not changing, and we're part of it. So it's evolve or die, just like it is in the rest of the environment, you know, it's, so the system needs to evolve, so it's, it's actually uh, rooting for us and helps us as best it can. It's part of this process because if we don't evolve, it doesn't evolve as well. Okay, now, here's the, here's the way that we, that we uh, win this game. Stuff happens, and we get to deal with it. That's the way the world works. Stuff happens, and we get to deal with it. The problem is, we focus all on the stuff happening, and pay very little attention to how we deal with it. That's what creates uh, the issues for ourselves. So, we get to deal with it by making choices. That's how we deal with it. And if those choices that we make lead us toward love, lead us toward lower entropy, lead us toward growing up, then those are low entropy choices and those are good choices. If those choices lead us to higher entropy, to fear, to belief and other things, then those are poor choices and they help us de-evolve. Because we can go either way. We have free will. Okay, so we can evolve or de-evolve. Okay, so what we do is we want to manipulate, and this is not what we should do, it's what we do, is that we want to manipulate the stuff happens. We spend almost all of our energy and time every day trying to make sure that the stuff that happens is the stuff we want to happen. Okay? That the way our relationship is going is the way we want it to go. That the way, you know, this nine-body, uh, you know, experience goes is the way we want it to go. It's the way we've planned it. It's the way it needs to go. So we spend most all of our time making sure that the stuff happens suits us. And when it doesn't suit us, we try to figure out a way to change that and make it suit us. And we spend very little time worrying about the quality of the choices we make. We make thousands of choices every day, little choices. And every one of them can be part of your evolution or part of your de-evolution based on the quality of the of the choice. And I mean, when I'm talking about choices, not necessarily which way to go at the fork of the road, but something happens and does it cause anxiety or not? Does it make you angry or not? You can choose those things. So if something happens and you get anxious or you get angry, that's a choice that you've made. And you may say, well, that's no choice at all, you know. Anybody would get angry there. I have to get angry there, but you don't have to get angry there. That's your choice. 
to do that. So these are the kinds of choices I'm talking about, choices of quality in your being. All right, so why, kind of the, the last thing, I guess, is why do we have a virtual reality here? Well, the virtual reality allows us to exercise our free will through choice. Okay? The virtual reality provides a context that gives evolutionary significance to our free will choices. Consciousness and free will are a match set. You cannot have consciousness if you don't have free will. You cannot have free will if you don't have consciousness. See? So if you have consciousness with both, but no free will, then the consciousness can't act because it's just a script. It can't actually do anything. And if you have free will without consciousness, there's nothing to act to do the free will. You see, those two are logically combined. So consciousness and free will must go together. Can't, ha can't work any other way. Um, I, talk a I want to talk a little bit about virtual reality because the reason that we can have an out-of-body experience is because we are consciousness experiencing a virtual physical reality. All right, so let, let's um, imagine you without a virtual reality. You know, this is a little bit what you get with an out-of-body. The out-of-body actually is a virtual reality. It's a very different virtual reality than this one. But let's imagine you without a virtual reality. Imagine seven billion people in a chat room. No rules. You have the free will, but what can you do with your free will? You can communicate or not, right? You can talk to any one individual or all of them at the same time if you want. So it's your free will to connect or to disconnect from any number, any individual. That's it, what else can you do? You know, what else do you have the free will to do? That's about it. That's your action that you can take in this massive chat room. Because you can't know anything of those you might communicate with except what they tell you. you uh, the only person you really know is you, and no one can do anything to directly affect you. Okay. Nor can you do anything that directly affects anyone else. All feedback is verbal, therefore intellectual. Okay. But feedback only exists if you choose to listen. Okay. Only if you choose to, uh, to listen and then act on it. So where does that leave you? You're an island. You exist alone at the center of your personal universe in a huge chat room of seven billion beings. Okay, now where, have, where does this leave you? Well, this leaves you the same place that uh, Descartes uh, landed in. You've arrived at uh, Descartes' understanding of existence. I think, therefore I am. Descartes was, was sent on a, uh, he sent himself on a mission to find out what was real. What could he count on? What was solid? What was it that was objective and solid that he could count on in his reality? And after some years of saying, well, not this, not this, he ended up with, I think, therefore I am. That was the only piece of solid, objective information that he could come up with. One, one item on a list, it's a short list. So that's basically where you are as a consciousness. He was describing life or reality from the viewpoint of a conscious awareness, of his own conscious awareness. Okay, it's also a perfect description of the fundamental characteristics of an individual unit of consciousness, okay, who is aware in the void. This state represents the foundation of your out-of-body experience. Okay. Now your out your out-of-body experience, as I said, you know, is a virtual reality. And within that virtual reality, there's some interaction between you and the larger consciousness system. And that interaction often in a virtual reality, because this larger consciousness system is is trying to help you succeed because your success is its success. It's sort of like having private tutoring from the larger consciousness session, session larger consciousness system. Um, so that's one of the advantages of this out-of-body state. It's one of the advantages of the dream state. When you're dreaming, it's sort of like private tutoring from the larger consciousness system. And so can out-of-body be. If you enter this out of body, like I say, without the fear, without the belief, without the expectations and ego. Okay, but in such a state as this, 
in such a state where you're a, you have no virtual reality at all um, and your only free will is to plug in or you know, check out, you're driven by that circumstance to be very self-focused because you are at the center of your reality here, which leads to being self-centered. Fear, arrogance, and ego flourish in such an environment. That's why you need to limit yours, your fear, arrogance, and ego before you go out of body. Okay? The out of body environment brings out, or we might say, enables you to easily express your fear, your belief, your expectations. Um, so only those who can really reduce their fear, reduce their beliefs and ego and so on, are able really to get out of the out-of-body experience what's there that's most valuable. If you don't reduce that fear first, then what you find when you go there is fear. Boogie man will jump out and grab you, you know. A monster will attack, you know. All these kinds of things will happen. Like Bob Monroe, you'll get stuck on the way home in a big wall and you won't be able to get over it or around it or through it. These things will happen. You'll find fearful things. That's because you have the fear. And the system doesn't really want you to be in the out-of-body state if you're carrying a lot of fear. So you have to pass these fear tests, if you will, or fear lessons in order to get there. When uh, Todd was telling us about his experience where he saw the hand coming out of the, kind of the, the light, well, what that was was a fear test. If he didn't have the, the courage to say, okay, and reach out for the hand, then that would have been the end of his journey toward going out of body. That would have been the end of it because he did have the courage to do that. Then the next step came and the next step came. And every place where you have the courage to go on, you go to the next step. You see, that was a, why was that hand there? You know, is the, is the out of body world full of dead hands floating around, you know? No, it's not. That was just there just for Todd. It was his hand to grab, you see? And it's the same, you know, with all of you. You know, various experiences will happen and you'll have these tests and if you don't pass them, it just means you have to lose some fear. You have to have uh, the courage to go on. Some people are afraid if they go out of body, they'll never come back. They may die in that state because something leaves the body, and the spirit leaves the body, and if the spirit doesn't live in the body, the body can't live, and all sorts of beliefs. You know, these are just beliefs, and if you have these beliefs, then you will experience them as big walls that don't let you back, and things like that. You know, so the, the things that you experience that frighten you is a representation of your own fear and of the system trying to, one, keep you out of where you don't belong, because if you get into the out-of-body state and you have all these fears, it just gets worse. You're going to make more fearful things that will scare you more, which will make it even harder for you to grow up later. So the system tries to prevent that. So that's where these, these things come from. Okay, um, so obviously, if this is what it's like just to be an individuated unit of consciousness, the larger consciousness system needs to create some kind of better, richer, or interactive environment for us to interact in where there's immediate feedback, where what we do comes back and we have to deal with the, with the results of what it is we're doing and who we are, right? Well, that's what the virtual reality is for. This is a learning lab that allows us to grow up in a much more effective and efficient way. This is the fast track. You know, people think of it the other way around. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm in this reality and this is the, this is the reality for dumb people, right? This is where all the, you know, the people that are real low go, you know, they come here to this, this plane or whatever, it's not true. This is the fast track. This is where you can get immediate feedback. This is where the quality of your being shows in everything that you do. And it comes back and bites you if it's not very good. And it makes you smile and gives you joy if it is good. So this is a wonderful place to, to be and to, uh, and to learn. All right. Um, so, um, experiencing within the larger unconstrained virtual realities, and that would be like dreaming reality and the out-of-body reality, would make evolving toward love a very slow process. Okay, if you were in these 
just in those realities. If we were just in out of body, just in dreaming, it would be a slow process. Okay, in such an environment, you tend to interact very honestly at the being level, and thus you can get all sorts of educational content tossed at you. And of course, then it's up to you to see how you choose to interact with it. That's the stuff happens, and you get to deal with it. That happens in out of body. That happens in the dream world. That happens here because that's the way consciousness works and because you're on duty 24 hours a day, whether you're out of body, whether you're dreaming, or whether you're in this reality. You see? So it all works the same way. And think about infants, you know, uh, babies in the physical reality. Um, you know, we start like, like that uh, individuated unit of consciousness without a VR, trying to explore the external data, data field struggling to figure out how to interpret the data so as to produce, produce consistency within our experience. Okay? That's, that's kind of the way we, the way we start. And uh, all that physical interaction we get, you know, the mom and the dad and the television running and the dog barking and the diapers being changed and the coos and the, and the pats and all of that stuff gives us choices. Choices for decisions and interacting. We can, we can choose how we interact with that stuff. What do we make of it? How do we interpret it? You see? So that's, that's where it starts. And the interesting thing is that the more rules you have, like this is a, we have a tight rule set in the physical reality. In the out-of-body reality, the dream reality, it's a much looser rule set. So in those realities, you can fly. Can't fly here. Doesn't work. Rules are too tight. We have a rule here, like gravity, and you know, it gets in the way of us flying, without airplanes anyway. So in those realities, there are a lot less rules. So they're a big step toward this no virtual reality concept that I started with talking, kind of taking a step in that direction. The interesting thing is that the more rules you have, you think more rules, less freedom, fewer decisions to make. That's not the way it works. That's a fear-based view of rules. So you can have a fear-based view of rules as that rules are what hem me in. Rules is what make me do what somebody else wants, not what I wanted. No rules means I get to do whatever I want. See, that's not what we're talking about here. That's not the thing. We're talking about rules defining a structure in which you interact. And then you say, no rules, no structure, nothing to interact with. See, nothing to do. Um, so the rules actually create choices. Take, for instance, two people standing, uh, say, uh, 200 yards apart on opposite ends of the field. And they're just standing there, and what they need to do is change places, each stand in the other spot. Okay? How, what are all the decisions they have to do to get there? Well, the only decision is whether to walk to the other spot or not, right? Simple. That's the only choice basically you have or to not walk at all. I guess those are, the, those are the things. But let's say that between those two, we build a maze. Now the maze is constraints, right? That's what it is. Can't go this way. Oh, you went that way and it's a dead end. That doesn't work. So a maze offers constraints, but what do the constraints offer? More choices. Now every 10 steps you make, you have to make another choice. And then you have to evaluate that choice for whether it was helpful or not helpful. So you see, it gives you a whole richer set of choices. So now your decision space, which is decision space is, is the, those decisions that you can make, that you know that you can make. Here's the decisions, here's the choices you have. Something happens, you have 10 choices. Those 10 choices represent your, de your decision space relative to that thing that happened. You have free will to make one of those choices. To get angry, not to get angry. You know, those are choices that you have. So your decision space actually grows and gets bigger, which means your reality grows and gets bigger. It means your awareness grows and gets bigger when you have these constraints. So you see, it's not that, oh, constraints means, you know, I'm hemmed in, I can't do things. Constraints set you free to do things. Okay. So that's the sense in which we're talking uh, in my lectures, I often talk about a card game. If you had uh, four people sitting at a table and a deck of cards in the center, and you just said, okay, go. You know, go do what? <laughs> you see, there's nothing to do. Where, what can your free will do with that? What's in your decision space? Well, now you make up a set of rules 
particularly a complex set of rules about what to do with these cards and what it means, now you've got schemes and strategies and choices and feedback and plans and assessments of whether that was a smart thing to do or not and so on. So all of this choice pops out of the rules, you see? So I'm going to talk later about you know these rules, but don't think of rules as, oh no, rules, I can't move. You know, the more rules I have, the more I have to do with somebody else. That's a fear-based view. That's the fear that somebody else is imposing rules on you. And the reason we have that fear-based sense of rules is because that's the way our life is. You know, that's the way the real world works. We have, we have to deal with rules all the time and generally don't like it. Okay, I'm going to give you like a list of things, and the point of this list is to catch the, the trend of what's going on here. Repetition. You're going to see a, uh, the fractal nature of what's going on, and I'm going to do it with talking about biology, physical biology, okay, because it's just a good example, because it, you can see this, how this process works. So we start with the first cell. Okay, now that first cell had a very small decision space. It wasn't a whole lot of choices and things that it could do. It just could exist. But the most profitable thing that it could do was split in two. Because now it had another cell to interact with, and now the choices of things that it could do and that interaction grew, right? And then those two could split and so on and split, and now you have a lot of different cells. But they're all just individual cells. What could they do? Well, they could sort of interact, but their interaction was very limited. Right? So what could they do that was most profitable? They could group up into groups of cells. Well, what does that mean? That means we have individuals coming together under constraints to, to produce something that is bigger than them, than themselves, right? That's what we have going on there. And at doing so, the constraints of the whole thing, and we'll call that a, what, a multi-cell creature as opposed to the one-cell creature. The multi-cell creature now gives those individual cells that make it up more freedom, not less, like we just discussed. More choices, bigger reality. It can do more. It can interact more. Okay, so now we have the individual cells, and we still have some of those around. Not all of them made that decision to evolve to something greater than themselves. Some of them are still around, we call them bacteria, right? That's mostly what are bacteria, the little one-celled things that are still hanging around. And some of those bacteria have become very important to these multi things too. So it's not like the fact that they went a different way and that sort of cuts them out. So anyhow, then the next step up is those groups of cells, those multi things. They become part of a larger group. Okay, now how do they do that? Well, now you have a, a system where you have differentiated functions. Okay, so now here's a system where you have this group of cells performs this function, and this group of cells performs a different function, and so on, but all these functions go together to make a whole, right? And maybe that's a jellyfish, and part of it is the tentacles part, and part of it is the, you know, the absorption and the digestion part, and part of it is the motion part and so on, and all these different kinds of groups of cells are now working together, they've become one. See, we keep having this, the individual cells kind of become one in a system, then those systems become one in a more complex system, okay? <coughs> and, of course, we're part of that, right? Here we are, and we've got billions of cells, and they're all differentiated into all kinds of organs and pieces, and it all works together, and every one of those cells is kind of one with the body, if you will. We don't have the heart saying that it's going to go on strike, you know, if the, you know, if the brain doesn't pay it more attention, or if it doesn't get a higher percentage of the allocation of energy or whatever. You know, it's not like that. They all do their part and work together. And again, someone might think, well, they're all real constrained. Those cells are real constrained they have more freedom and more choice <coughs> and more decision space. I'm using these words you know, as metaphors. I'm not really telling you that individual cells are conscious, but they have, they have more things that they can do that makes more difference to themselves than they had as individual cells. It keeps getting better. All right, so if that's the way it's going, then uh, you know, we can take it uh, another step. You know, imagine that... Uh, that these uh, 
these groups of cells then turn into a differentiate again and we have differentiation of species okay, evolving to fulfill different niches niches I guess it's called in, a, in the environment okay then we go up the next step where we have cooperation uh, between species and then we have a biome right the ecology of cooperative interdependence that supports all the life in the biome okay the groups of species evolving together to become one larger more effective ecosystem so you see the trend how this goes okay and now let's get to us the human beings okay so um, you know we are here right to evolve the quality of our interaction to the point that we cooperate with other human beings with other critters with other plants and minerals and everything to the earth right and everything on it that we can cooperate in such a way that we become one with all of that and that doesn't limit us that frees us okay something bigger than ourselves now we're still all just physical inside this virtual reality all right um, let's just keep this let's just keep this going so then what happens next if we get to that point as then is it going to be we the the planet uh, are all together united in love as one group that's all interactive and caring for each other and then what is it we have to learn to coalesce and group with other planets with other solar systems with other galaxies you know how far does this go and eventually get to the point where we have to connect and coalesce with other reality systems so see it just keeps going up and you kind of see the thing well all of this is just conjecture of course until I mean at least what I've just last said it's all conjecture the biology part's not conjecture that's happened but um, all of this is just kind of wild conjecture because the next step can't happen until we do our part which is to come together as one on this planet with all that is here and until we figure out how to do that all the rest of it's just probable future you know isn't going to happen yet until we do that because you can't skip steps you know if those multi-celled things decided that was it they weren't going to do anything else then we wouldn't be here we're, we're a couple of steps down from that you can't skip steps but it just gives you a bigger picture of the point of what we're doing and where we're going and uh, how that works um, so what we're talking about is lower, lowering entropy through cooperative grouping okay that's what we're we're doing all right so what is this co cooperative grouping together it's moving away from being self-focused to being other focused right those individual cells they had to go from being just them to a cooperative effort group focused moving away from fear ego belief and toward love that's what we're talking about okay and human terminology our terminology other focused is the defining characteristic of love that's how you know what you know whether you're what you're doing is love based or not if it's about other then it's not love based even if it's well I'm really worried about that you're not doing what I know would be best for you so that worries me and it's really you know it's really about you but that's not it it's really about me you see and what I what I think you should be doing so we can't confuse that with love. Love is when it's about other. It really is, what can I do that optimizes your life? What can I do that, that makes you grow, makes you happy? You see, that's about other. But if it's, what do I need that makes me happy? What do I need that meets my needs? My wants, my desires, my fears, my beliefs. You know, Then it's not love. So love is defined as... A vector flowing out and ego is defined as a vector flowing in okay, so that's so you can see now what we've been talking about right up through these cells okay is you know we're talking about relationships flowing out that's that's the you know I'm talking about evolution so we see these cycles these patterns in evolution and we see that we're part of this pattern and it kind of lets you know what it is we're supposed to be doing next, right? Kind of where we are in the pattern, and where we need to go as people. Okay, so it's not moving toward restriction. Okay, each cell's a free agent. 
Well, now when I'm talking about cell, I'm talking about kind of a, the, the uh, metaphor cell, where we are a cell in the larger, you know, in the larger, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, ecology of the planet. You know, we're a cell in that. Different cell than others, but you know, we're each independent. But we're all free agents. We all have our own decision space, and that decision space increases, not decreases, with cooperation. You know, we do what we do because that's what we choose to do. We have the free will to make those choices. And we, and we do that because it's what we want to do. It's the choice we make, not because we are ever forced to make any of those choices. Nobody can force us to make choices. It seems like that sometimes, but we get to make the choice. Always. That means we get to have the responsibility for the choice. Always. Okay, no being's ever forced to make any choice. It always has a free will to choose from within its decision space. Unfortunately, most of us can only imagine a freedom that is defined in terms of our fear and ego because we define ourselves and our relationships and our world in terms of our fear and ego. That's what we do. Um, we have a fear of being forced, coerced, pressured, tricked, manipulated, um, pressure from the outside. And that's kind of the way our world works. So we think that's the way everything works and it, it does not. Mm -hmm. That's how your reality functions if you do not interact within a community of love. Okay? Fear erodes trust. Without trust, cooperation is impossible. Without cooperation, we all stand alone in fear. Okay. So when uh, biological cells stop cooperating and working together effectively, or are invaded from the outside, or invade others, we call it disease. When cells get greedy, or begin building their own little non-cooperative empires within the cooperative body, they begin to consume more resources, okay, than, uh, uh, than, our, uh, than they contribute. We call it cancer. The same applies to this general word, cells. Cells, the metaphor, you see. All right, so now what does it mean to go out of body? Now the reason that what I, I said before was important is that you need to have, what's, in, what's important about going out of body, one of the most important things is to have a reason why. Why do you want to go out of body? And I'm just, what I've said just previously now, kind of is the underlying opinion for what that reason needs to be. It needs to be to learn, to grow up, to experience, to become more. This needs to be your purpose. If your purpose is to have fun, you know, like it's a carnival ride, or, uh, you know, to see what, you know, I want a remote view so that I can see the inside of the ladies' locker room, you know. <laughs> I want to I wanna do the, you know, I want to get the stock, you know, what the stock's going to be, you know, next next month and invest properly. I want to know what the lottery number is. If, this, if these are your motivations, then you'll have problems. It'll be difficult getting there. It won't work very well for you and you'll run into things that will probably chase you away and within years you'll stop and you won't even be part of the process anymore. You guys are part of the continuing process because you're succeeding. It's working. That's why you're, most of you have come back and come back again. So it's a, you, can, you can tell when it's a learning, growing process and when it's a gee whiz process. Now gee whiz is often the pretty flower that attracts the, you know, the hummingbird, right? So the gee whiz is okay, but you have to grow beyond the gee whiz. That's part of the process of using the out-of-body experience as a growth tool. You have to outgrow that. All right, so what does it mean to go out of body? First thing is it has nothing to do with your body. Okay. Um, that belief generates all sorts of nonsense, you know, rolling out, climbing ropes, silver cords, walls that trap you and doom you, uh, you know, not coming back, locale one, you know, all of these things are derivatives from that belief that out of body starts with a body. You're a soul, it lives in the body, or you're a consciousness and it lives in the body and now it has to get out so that it can experience. That's why most beginners, when they first get out of body, see their bedroom or whatever room their body's in, 
see their body lying there. Why would they do that? You know, is that the most interesting place for them to go? It's not their bedroom. <laughs> Why do they do that? They do that because they believe that they came from inside the body. You see? That they came out of body. So when you come out of this body, what are you going to see when you look around? You're going to see the body, right? Because that's where you came from. Well, of course, after a while, you give that up and it disappears. That's because it doesn't really exist. All the locale one, which is all the um, out-of-body experiences that are near Earth, if you will, locale one, um, most of these have to do with the idea that reality is physical. And you can view it from the physical or from the non-physical, but reality is this reality, you know, and that's a belief. So that's where you come and that's what you experience. So the first out-of-bodies are flying around in this near-Earth place, seeing things and doing things. And that's good because that's where you get evidential stuff from. And getting evidential material is very important. You need to convince yourself that this is real. So in the beginning, this locale one interaction is very good because everybody starts with, I don't know if it's real or not, I'm gonna find out, right? They need to be convinced. And locale one is the only place where you can be convinced because that's where you can check back and see if what you saw was real. What do you mean by that? Was in the physical reality, because see, that's what's real. So we define what's real by physical reality. That's our standard for reality. If it doesn't pertain to the physical reality, then we can't tell whether it's real or not. See, of course, this physical reality isn't any more or less real than your dream reality or your out-of-body reality. They're all equally real. But this physical reality is our base of operations, and we can't convince us that it's real unless we can track it back to something that happened physically. Oh, I went so-and-so in my out-of-body or my remote viewing, and here's what I saw, and then you find out that's what was there. Uh, that's now evidence, you see? So it's important to get evidence in the beginning because that's the only way you'll know that what you're doing is real, which means relates to the virtual reality that we call physical. That's our definition of real. All right. Um, when I say that... Uh, that that belief that getting out of body uh, you know, has created a lot of nonsense, I kind of take the word nonsense back in a way. You know, I, I say that in a, in a logical sense, not in, a, in a, an emotional sense. It's, lo it's nonsense logically. It's not necessary. It's not a logical condition for getting there. What it, what it creates is a lot of ritual, a lot of rules, a lot of um, uh, tools. Okay, we make tools. So all of the techniques that you've been learning about going out of body, all these techniques are just tools. There's nothing particularly fundamental about any of them. They're things that people make up out of nothing, right? Made up out of thin air in order to help you focus your intent on becoming aware in a different reality system. So all the techniques. Now, techniques are required. Why are all these techniques required to trick you into having a useful intent? Well, they're required because you have fear, and you have beliefs, and you have ego, and that's why we need to be tricked. Because we can't just do it, we have to be tricked into it. So we need to do something that uh, helps us focus our intent in a, in a useful way. And in the beginning, the, the uh, techniques are not only useful, they're probably necessary. You have to start out with where you are. You can't suddenly just get to a place where you don't need the techniques. You should get there eventually, but in the beginning, you need them because you do have the fear, and you do have the beliefs, you do have expectations. You read, you know, Journeys Out of the Body, and you know what it is it's supposed to be like, and you know, you know, Bob Monroe rolled out of body. You know, so there's thousands of people behind there, you know, rolling, trying to roll, and then he's squinting on, am I out yet, you know? And that's because they, they have this expectation that that's, that that's the way it works. That becomes ritual. If you have techniques, these techniques are personal because you have your own personal fear, expectations, and beliefs, and ego. Therefore, you need your own personal bag of tricks for convincing yourself to have a useful intention 
Okay, well, what is it that you're intending to do? You're just intending to switch data streams. This virtual reality is data stream to a consciousness. This physical body isn't it. This is just a virtual body. This is just a virtual brain. The virtual brain doesn't really store or compute information. It's just a virtual brain, like it's a virtual body. All of that's done in consciousness. You're an avatar, just like your elf in World of Warcraft, you see. You're an avatar. Now, you're the, when you're working the controls of World of Warcraft, now you're the consciousness behind the avatar, right? Well, you, know, you have a part of you. You're, you're not your physical system. You're the consciousness behind you that's, that's working the controls that's learning, that's growing, that's lowering its entropy through this experience. See, so that's how, that's how that works. So we need the tools, and the tools should be personal. That's why you go through a whole bunch of tools. That's why there's 50 different tools, or 150 different tools, because every tool will work differently for different people. And you shouldn't be, um, you, you shouldn't be, uh, uh, as they say, afraid to make your own tools. Nobody can make a tool for you that suits you any better than yourself. So you don't have to stick with somebody says, here's a tool and here's what you do, you know, and what they do is, I heard one that made me laugh the other day is that the, you're lying in there and you, you go up a rope, pull yourself out of body, you know, but, well, that was, you know, that was clever, you know, but make your own tool. Maybe you do flips. Maybe you float. Maybe you get little jet engines tied to your hips, shoots you up, you know. Maybe a big hand comes down and grabs you and pulls you out. It doesn't matter. Whatever resonates with you, you see, that will be an effective tool for you, and it may not be effective for anybody else. So when you, if you work at a tool, and a tool just isn't working, let it go. Go to another tool. Make up a tool. The tool is a gimmick. It's a it's a way of looking at things that incorporates your fear, beliefs, and ego into ha making you have an intent to pick up a different data stream than this data stream. So now you're in the out-of-body data stream. Eventually, you let the tool go. Eventually, you realize that all it is is switching your focus. And you're there. It takes you one second. You're in an out-of-body state. One second, you're back. Or you don't have to come back. You can be in the out-of-body state, and you can still be in this state, having a conversation. And you can be out-of-body state. You see, it just, you don't require the tool. What happens with tools is you take a tool, you find a tool that works. So then you use it, and you use it, and you use it, and you make a ritual out of it. Now you can't get out of body unless you do this ritual. Whatever the ritual is, it's necessary now for you to get out of the body. Well, you've limited yourself. The ritual isn't really necessary. None of the rituals are necessary. They're there to get us our mind to think in the right way. So think of your out-of-body uh, techniques and, and uh, tools and so on as one, you can personalize them. You know, maybe you only want to climb halfway up the rope and then have a big hand come down and grab you. You know, that'd be your own little twist on the rule. You know, we'll do that. You know, do that. So that's, you know, I don't want to downplay and say, well, you know, these are, they're just tools, you know, and all this stuff is nonsense. Well, logically it's nonsense, but we need that kind of nonsense to help us focus where we need to focus. So that's basically the things that you're learning. Eventually, you need to get the training wheels and take them off the bike, right? But don't try to take them off too soon. Or, you know, you'll crash and it'll be difficult. And don't berate yourself as, oh, I still have to use training wheels. That just makes it worse. So do what you have to do to make it work, but realize that what you're doing is not fundamental. All right. Um, you're just focusing your awareness in a different data stream. That's all it is. You make that connection by your intent, your consciousness. Within consciousness, intent is what motivates. Intent is what is the prime mover. Intent is what changes things. When you do get out of body, you'll notice that if you intend to be someplace else, at some other place, you're just there. Now, in the beginning, you have a belief that you have to move to get from A to B. So then what do you do? You have to fly. 
well, it gets tedious, takes a little longer, you know. And then eventually you get to fly real fast. When you start flying, there you are, you're there already. You see, that's kind of making a short trip because you got bored with the long flying trip. Well, you can just let all the flying go all together. You can just go because it's intent. Your intention moves you around. You don't need physical process, okay, for any of those things. Um, all right, a couple of things about your, your intent is that the intent can be of poor quality or high quality. Your focus can be of poor or high quality. Um, I recommend a good place to start is with point consciousness. Point consciousness is when you are just a point of awareness floating in the void. There's nothing there. There's no light. There's no space. There's no body. There's nothing. You're just awareness in the void. Okay? That's the state of point consciousness. That's the doorway. In some, in some, um, uh, what should I say? Some uh, religions, maybe some practices. That's the end point. You work all your life to get to the point where you can get the point consciousness and just float there in the void, in nirvana, and that's you've arrived. That's the beginning point. That's a state that should be able to get and hold as long as you want. That's where you should start. Okay? And practice on that. Practice through meditation. In meditation, you kind of get to that point. A lot of times when you're meditating, you just sometimes you're just drifting and there's nothing there. Get to know that state. Float in it. Enjoy it. It's a very nice state. You'll come back energized. It feels good there. Um, a lot of time passes by. You come back. You think you've been gone for 10 minutes. You've been there you know, for an hour. It's that sort of thing. But if that's a state, if you can hold it, get to it when you want and hold it, then everything else goes from there. That's your doorway to healing, out of body, talking, communicating, you know, whatever it is you want to do, channeling, it's, that's, the, that's your quiet start. So um, a good quality intent is one that's noiseless. Okay, you have an intention and there's no noise. It's a clear, call that powerful intent. What's the noise? The noise is all this jabber going on in your mind all the time. The noise is the, is the constant thoughts that intrude. And of course, that's what your meditation teaches you to do, right? Your meditation teaches you to let all that noise go to where your intent is now just a pure, focused intent. Well, once you get to that point consciousness, you're already there, right? There is no noise. There are no thoughts. There's nothing but I am. You're at Descartes' you know, landing zone, right? You're I am and that's it. So when you're in that place of no thoughts, then your intention from there is very strong and very focused. That's why it's a good place to start. Until you can get there to that point consciousness, your focus is noisy. It's got thoughts, it gets interrupted. It's jumping around our thoughts jump from thing to thing to thing to thing. They may, they may only last in your mind for a, a millisecond, but you'll be thinking about something else and something else and something else. And it happens so fast we often don't even know. If you look at, a, if, if you look at the brainwave scan, sometimes you'll see these little patterns and they're doing this all the time. You know, you look at the scan. Well, that's all this activity going on in your head. When you look at somebody that's in that point consciousness state, all that jumping around kind of settles down. You don't see that kind of stuff anymore. So that's part of what you, you do in meditation. Well, practicing your out-of-body, the same techniques you use for out-of-body are same kind of techniques that work with meditation. The two aren't that different as far as, you know, what's going on. Um, locale, locale one, uh, out-of-body, and remote viewing are basically the same thing. You know, that's what remote viewing is. Remote viewing is that you travel with your awareness and you pick up information someplace else, right? Well, that awareness is no longer in your body, as if it ever was in your body. It's out there now, picking up data. What both of them are is you're collecting data from the database. This is a virtual reality. It's based on information. There are databases here. There's a future probable reality and there's a past reality, and then of course you're living in the present. And when you're remote viewing and when you're in locale one, all you're doing is getting data from the database. Your intention 
is the, is the uh, query for the database. I intend to see what's going on at these coordinates or at that place, or I want to go someplace in the outer body, you know, that's near Earth, that I want to look. You just, your intention is to gather the data at that spot, what it looks like, what it's like to be there, and there it is. You collect that data. So whether it's out of body and you visualize it as yourself, as a disembodied consciousness awareness floating around and looking, or whether you visualize it as an image coming on a big monitor, or whether you visualize it as just a kind of an eyeball in space, that's all your tool. Okay? That's, again, that's, that's your tool that you make up to help you put in context what you're doing. We tend to need to find context for what we're doing. So you say, well, I'm, some people will look at a screen. They see it like it's a movie. Some people are the floating eyeball. Some people are, a, are a, an out-of-body body that's flying around. Those are all just different contexts for the same thing. You're collecting data from the database of what's happening here in this plane. It's also why sometimes the stuff isn't right. Because uh, you'll have an out-of-body and you'll go into a house and you'll say, well, I saw that there was this big pot of flowers that was just off to the left. And then there was this and this, and then you go and check and see if it's right. And well, there was a pot of flowers, but it was on the other side. You see, you, you see things, but you see them sometimes switched, mirror images, uh, uh, the wrong way. Well, I saw all daisies, and it's actually, uh, you know, a big sunflower. You know, and you see things like, but you got it, it was a flower. So you say, well, that's a hit. You know, I, I did see the flower there, but wrong kind of flowers, wrong place. Well, why do you do that? That's because the data in the databases is not all that precise. The data in the database is, you know, you don't, the database doesn't want to collect every bit of information. Too many bits. It only wants to collect what's likely to be useful, what's likely to be there. So that there was a flower there, all right, it got that, saved that bit, that it was daisies or uh, whatever, maybe not. That it was on the left or right, maybe not. But when you draw the information out and it has to put it in some kind of context, then it goes here, it goes there. It's not necessarily that buttoned down. Database would be big if you had to collect every bit that existed. So details are sometimes left out. And sometimes your interpretation is left out, is, is wrong. If you don't know, if you don't specify in the database that you're on you know, that you're on this side looking that way as opposed to that side looking this way, you'll get mirror images. That's just because your query isn't precise. You see, you didn't see. So now the flowers are on the right instead of on the left. Well, you're just getting the view out of the database from the other side because you didn't tell the query where you were. So it gives you, that's why you get a lot of mirror image stuff. The query doesn't know exactly your your position. You don't tell it. The query is just like any query. It's like Google. You know, you send it in a query and it comes back with information. A sloppy query, you get lots of junk back. A very precise query, you get very precise information back. That's why a lot of times when, uh, when people, uh, I do these exercises where we have remote viewing targets and there'd be like five of them. And I have two or three people every time say, I got all five of them, but I got them in the wrong order. You know? Or I got all five of the diagnosis of the health things, but I got <coughs> Sam's diagnosis when I was supposed to be getting marriage, you know. Well, that's because their, their uh, query wasn't precise. Their query in their mind was saying something like, I want the information on, you know, the subject, you know, on, I don't know, on, you know, on Tom's health subject or what, you know. Well, Tom had five health subjects. If you don't say, and we need the information on, you know, Mary, then you don't necessarily get it on Mary. You get it on one of Tom's health subjects. It could be any one of the five. So it's, the, it's that they're not thinking precisely. They're thinking in terms of general thoughts, and they get general information back. So that happens, like I say, a few people all the time will get all of them right, wrong order. Their thinking is loose. That's the problem. Has, has, it's not... All right, uh, so other locales, just like chakras, are metaphors for information, content, structure, relationships between information. By metaphor, I don't mean it's false, you know, or not real. You know, nevertheless, that relationship 
between a metaphor and what is real can easily become confused. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. You know, it's like the silver cords. We'll talk about that later. Likewise, not physical does not imply not real. Okay? We're a little like conscious, conscious Sims characters dreaming about playing World of Warcraft and then talking about how the World of Warcraft characters are false and not real like the Sims characters are. You know, that's sort of the way we are. We're virtual beings here talking about how we're more real than that stuff in the outer body and whatever, but it's just another virtual reality too. It's all the same. Okay, metaphors are necessary for us to organize information into something we can use and share. If we don't use metaphors, we can't, we can't share the information. Metaphors, words, definitions are metaphors. You know, that's how we have to do it. So you go out of body, you get data. Now you have to translate that data back into a physical metaphor because physical metaphors are the only ones that we can turn into language. We don't have metaphors and words and vocabulary for non-physical things. They all have to turn. So you go in out of body and what do you do? You say, I saw this, I saw that, I smelled, I touched, I did all these things. Well, these are all physical senses, right? You don't have physical senses in the outer body. You just get a data stream. But you interpret it as physical senses. Okay? That's metaphor. So you get these, these, um, these metaphor, and it has to be in a physical context. Without the physical context, we can't explain it to anybody else because our whole vocabularies, our languages that we speak, we're all derived and risen within a physical context. That's what they describe. You see? So, again, everything relates back to the physical. Now, if you are, if you have five people watching the same accident, those descriptions are similar. But as you get into stuff that's stranger and less and less part of your experience, how do you interpret them back into some kind of physical metaphor? You see, it gets wilder and wilder, right? And the fits get sloppier and sloppier. So when you listen to reports from the outer body, don't listen to the words. Read between the lines. It was, what was the feeling? You know, what was the intent? What was the significance? Instead of, oh, did they have little pointy ears? Or were they, you know, big round, you know, not so pointy ears? That doesn't matter. You see, that's just personal interpretation. So that's metaphor we needed or we couldn't communicate it would just be us in our experience but uh, you have to be aware of metaphors so let's say um, here's a limitation let's say that uh, you go out of body or we can imagine somebody uh, actually from about uh, 70 or 80 years ago went out of body and they got a message something out there gave them a message that implied that an out of body experience somehow is dependent on your physical body well, that's true. Your out-of-body experience is dependent on your physical body. And we can prove that by the cold water test. If you're out-of-body, you're having an out-of-body experience, and somebody throws a bucket of cold water on your body, what happens? That out-of-body experience is done, right? And you come right back, you know, to share the uncomfortable misery of being wet and cold. <laughs> so that's the cold water test. Well, people take that and they say, well, that proves then that the out of body is a lesser reality than this physical virtual reality because it's dependent on it. But that's not the case, you see, because let's say that you were just, you know, let's say that we were in A. We were in place A and we were out of body. And when we were out of body, we were in B. And that could be locale anywhere, right? We're in B. So if that's the case, we originated in A, out of body in B, somebody throws cold water on us in A, B disappears and comes back. But guess what? The same happens the other way. If you're aware in B and you have an out of body and you're in A, and somebody throws cold water on you in B, your out of body in A collapses and goes back. You see? It, it works the same way. It's all symmetric. So it doesn't mean that, that you know, a is more real than B, or B is more real than A. It's that that's your place of origin. You're here in this virtual reality, and from this virtual reality, you can do an out-of-body. But it's an extension of you through this virtual reality to another virtual reality. And I don't know whether you, any of you have done it or not, but while you're out-of-body, you can actually go out-of-body again. You can do out-of-body from your out-of-body, and you can go other places, and it's an extension of that. So you that get thrown cold water on, that one will collapse, but not necessarily the other one, you see? So it, 
it moves around like that. So it's not that A or B is more fundamental. It's just that it's where you start from. Why? Because you're here, because you're a piece of consciousness that's involved in this virtual reality game. So things that happen to your player come back to you. Just because your player is having an out of body, you know, it still comes through the same VR. So that's the way that works. Uh, but what happens then is that this guy gets this information. Okay, somehow his out of body is dependent on his body, and he gets that as a piece of information, and that's truth. But because he's limited, his metaphor for that is well, that's sort of like a, a deep sea diver in an air hose. You see, that would be a metaphor for your dependent, you know, the deep sea diver. He's dependent on another place uh, to keep him going and so on. And then that, that metaphor turns into a silver cord. Because in out-of-body state, of course, you have to have visual metaphors if you're going to come back and tell somebody what you saw. So now that uh, diving metaphor turns into a silver cord. So now you come back and you report, well, there's a silver cord attached between my shoulder blades that ties me to my body. And that works so nicely because I have this belief, you see, that this soul came out of the body and has to be attached to it. And if the, you know, if the body, something happens to the body while the soul's out, then the soul will be lost forever. And if something happens to the soul, then the body will die and won't go on. So you've got all this belief nonsense about the body and the soul and the silver cord that all just has to do with beliefs at that time. So you go back 80 years when Muldoon and Carrington and others and Fox were doing this stuff and everybody had a silver cord between their solar blades. Well, we don't have the same theology anymore that we had then. We don't have the same belief system. So most of us don't have silver cords. Some still do because some read that stuff and you know it's part of their reality now. So they have silver cords. And that's all right. You know, it's, it's not that that's, you know, they're the dumb people with the silver cords. That's the wrong <laughs> attitude. You know, silver cord's part of their metaphor. It's okay. Uh, now, if that metaphor limits you, oh, I can't go that far away because my cord's not that long, you see? <laughs> if it limits you, then now it's a problem. But if it doesn't limit you, it's not really a problem. So it's not really to be, to be worried about. Okay, so uh, personal fear and ignorance and cultural beliefs can often misinterpret accurate data as a metaphor. And you have to be aware of that because you go out and have experiences and you come back and you tell people about them and you need to be aware that what you're telling them, what you saw, is a metaphor for data that you received. And they need to be aware when listening to it that that's your personal data and that if they don't see the same thing, it's not like they've failed, you see? So that's the problem we have with, with telling stories about our experiences in our body. So... You know, Bob Monroe wrote his book and he told a lot of experiences and in Bob Monroe's mind, the out-of-body reality was an objective place. And if anybody went to the same place, they'd see the same thing. He didn't see it as his interpretation of the data that he got. And so he went to a park where he relaxed and it was a nice place for him to hang out in the park. And then other people started looking for the park. But you know, one man's park is another man's rowboat floating in the middle of a pretty lake somebody else's mountaintop, right? Somebody else's cabin in the woods. So you go out looking for a park and you don't find one, then you'll get frustrated and you'll make one. And you'll make it just like the one that was described in the book. And then you've been to that park too, you see? So that's the way the silver cord got around. Everybody had silver cords because I think it was Muldoon and Carrington uh, started out with the silver cord business and, and uh, everybody else then had one too because they interpreted it. They had a similar metaphor. So you need to be a little careful about, the, about what's going on. Now, but I said earlier, right, that this is real. Well, it is real. And the, the way we often differentiate between real and not real is, is the data coming from outside of us or is the data coming from inside of us? But this is a good differentiation in the beginning. It's not a good differentiation later on, but only in the only in the beginning. Okay, so how do we know how do we know the difference? And uh, 
and uh, what difference does it make actually in the in the long run? Those are two two good questions. When it comes from inside of you, it's actually foreign to you. It's not yours. I mean, if it comes from outside of you, it's foreign to you. It's not yours. If it comes from inside of you, it's using your own metaphors. It's using your own language. It's using your own, you know, it's, it's a familiar, familiar language, if you will, given that language we speak in metaphors. Okay? If it's coming outside of you, it often is much more difficult to get. Okay, the way you can tell the difference is that you you have to spend time with it. You have to, it's not that you can take one look and say, oh, there's the difference. You know, the little red light blinks when it's inside of me and the green light blinks when it's not. It's not like that. You have to spend time with it. It's, let's say it's somebody that you're talking to. You're having a conversation with another being. You can't just have one conversation for a few minutes and then say, well, I wonder if that was real or I was making that up. It's not enough data. So you don't have enough data to determine that. Or you go out of body and said, well, I just saw that light hand and everything there. Did I just make that up or was that real? You see, you're judging too soon. Judge you will have to do one day, but not too soon. Just have the experience. Talk to that person. Ask them if you can come back and see them again. And if so, how would you connect with them? And maybe they'll give you a name or maybe they'll say, just think of this experience and you'll be there or whatever. Do it again and again. And if you do it enough that, it, that you get some sense, I mean, not, you're not just staring in each other's eyes, right? You're exchanging information, you're talking, you're asking questions, you're pulling out information. If the information is meaningful to you, if it helps you, if you grow from it, then does it matter where it came from? Does it matter whether it's you or somebody else? And likewise, if that information isn't helpful at all, I mean, you just don't learn anything from it, does it matter whether it came from you or whether it came from outside of you? So you see, in a bigger sense, it doesn't really matter. The key is, is it useful? Can you use that information? Okay. But if you really want to know if it's outside of you, then keep up going till you get enough information that you can tell that you can tell these are concepts that just weren't in my mind. You know, it's surprising the information you get. Okay, five minutes, we're going to take a break. So if it surprises you, if it gives you data that otherwise you don't have, if, if it says, well, you know, you know, your great grandfather was so-and-so, da 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 and you didn't know that, so you go back and you find somebody in your family who could tell you, and sure enough, it's true. Well, then it came from outside of you, right? Now, outside of you includes the databases I'm talking about. You know, that's outside of you. So uh, if you don't ask meaningful questions and you don't get meaningful answers, you won't necessarily ever know. But if you're not doing that, then you're wasting your time. You might as well not do it. So ask meaningful questions. Get the information. And after you've been talking to this guy or this woman for you know, six months and you've got 50 hours logged of conversation, you'll know whether it's outside of you or not. You'll know how surprising the data is, how foreign it feels to you, how ripe the facts were or wrong. But in the last analysis, it doesn't really matter. That's just for your own evidential peace of mind. That just makes your ego feel better that you know because now you can put it in that category. Oh, this was outside of me. I feel better. You know, this was inside of me. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> when the actual fact is that it doesn't matter. If you learn something, and it was valuable, take it. Doesn't matter where it comes from. If it doesn't mean anything to you, don't say, well, I, that was outside of me, so it must be right, it must be true, it must be this because it wasn't mine, and everybody outside of me must be learned and, and wise, and it's only me that's the dope. So if it comes from outside of me, believe it, that would be a mistake. So it's, what does it do for you? You see, that's the key. So uh, we're gonna take a break. Now, for how long, Todd? Um, let's take a break till it's just on almost uh, 7.40, so say 8 o'clock, we'll pick it back up. Okay, well, I gotta get going. I need to move, I need to move faster. All right. An hour and 40 minutes gone already.